Good evening, my name is Ryan Stanton and today I will be presenting a PowerPoint presentation on a topic that I feel I have learned a lot from and I feel hopefully that I can share some of this knowledge that I've learned with you. So um, before we jump into this, I would like to say um, I've never had to do anything like this before. Um, I know everything's different because of the coronavirus and the online class. I do apologize for the setup. I was not prepared to be doing a 10 minute video presentation in my house, but um, here we are. So I would like to thank, uh, first off, Professor, thank you for giving us this opportunity to research this topic and this subject. And I would like to thank my dad, who's currently working the camera right now. Um, and yes, so without, without any further ado, let's just jump into it. Um, my name is Ryan Stanton, and this is a lesson in self-efficacy. So to start off, we need to get an understanding of what self-efficacy actually is and where the theory and the idea got started from. So self-efficacy is an organizational management theory that has been around since about 1977. Um, a man named Albert Bandura began researching self-efficacy to see how he could improve worker relations in the workplace and also how he could improve worker efficiency in the workplace. Um, Self-efficacy nowadays is a topic of many research articles. Um, it's a very fascinating subject, and I think a lot of people are interested in it because it can overall increase it can increase an individual's work output, and um, when that happens, it can the overall company's output will increase, and the company will see drastic changes in the upward direction in pricing and and uh, in profits so obviously everyone wants profits these days so that's why it's such a big uh, big theory right now but as I mentioned earlier um, it is a relatively new theory um, many theories um, about organizational behavior have been around since the 30s and the 40s um, but yes this one was not created until 1977 so that's just a little basis of what self-efficacy is now let's talk about what it means um, self-efficacy a lot of words that you hear with the pronoun self are you know self some self help you hear self assured you hear self conscious um, I feel like self efficacy doesn't really fit into that category very well um, the best way to describe self efficacy as it relates to an individual is it's similar to self confidence but it it goes deeper into who you are as a person and who you are as a worker within an organization so let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, there's four main components of self-efficacy, and during this presentation, I'd like to break those individual components down and show what they mean, how they affect you, and what you can do to improve them, as well as throw in some personal anecdotes on how I've seen these components play out in my life. So, first of these, here the, four, the four components um, of self-efficacy and the self-efficacy process uh, the first one is inactive mastery experiences. The second one is vicarious learning. The third is verbal persu persuasion. And the fourth is kind of a double, it's psychological and emotional arousal. So we're gonna go ahead and dive into them individually and break them down. Uh, this first one, inactive mastery experiences. Inactive mastery experiences are my personal favorite way of increasing self-efficacy. And they're best described by it's a hands-on learning experience. So when you engage in an active mastery experience, you physically do the work or accomplish the task that, you're, that you have been designated to do. And through this inactive mastery learning experience, you give yourself confidence that you can accomplish the task, as well as you learn how to, you learn how to accomplish the task. So in the future, it uh, will not be as daunting. So it's, it's a hands-on learning process. Um, it's a very personal experience. I think inactive mastery experiences work so well in boosting self-efficacy because it relates to you as an individual and nothing tells you that you can do something like doing it. So uh, for this reason, I believe that inactive mastery experiences is the most influential component of the self-efficacy process and that's kind of why I wanted to hit on it first. Um, in my personal life, I know um, I for the longest time I've always enjoyed music. I've enjoyed listening to it. And I've, I've thought about playing before, maybe picking up an instrument, but I didn't get around to it until about January 1st of this year. 
and I, I picked up a, a guitar and I started playing. And um, at first it was really tough. It was a real struggle uh, trying to learn everything from scratch with no really prior knowledge other than the fact that I'd listened to music before. And um, it got really it got really tough. I mean, there was for the first about month or two, I didn't have very much self confidence in myself. I was playing the chords wrong. I couldn't get any rhythm going, and I certainly couldn't master any songs. And uh, but I continued to push forward, and I eventually learned a uh, a couple of my old favorite classics from back in the day, some simple songs. And um, I feel like once I learned these first couple of songs, the learning became much easier and it became much more enjoyable because I gained that inactive mastery experience in being able to learn those songs and performing them. So that's how uh, inactive mastery experiences has manifested itself in my life. Uh, moving on, the second, uh, the second component of the self-efficacy process that I will be discussing is the vicarious learning process. Um, vicarious learning is, uh, is another very influential component of gaining self-efficacy. And uh, it's, it's defined by a couple of things. The first one, visual cues, visual and audio cues. Um, vicarious learning occurs when, say, my, you know, you wanna learn how to, um, how to you wanna become proficient in Excel. It's in a, in a word processing system. A vicarious learning experience would be one in which you, you watch somebody become proficient in Excel and through watching them accomplish that task, it gives you the self-confidence that you need to attack that task and it'll increase your self-efficacy. Um, one kind of simpler way to put it, it's, uh, it's in a saying is always time, but I believe it's true to this day, it's monkey see, monkey do. And um, so like I was saying, by seeing somebody accomplish the task that you're looking for and you're trying to accomplish, you will be able to increase your self-efficacy and hopefully accomplish that task as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I believe this is a very effective form of self of increasing self-efficacy because humans have a natural tendency to strive to be better around other humans that are striving to be better. Um, I've seen vicarious learning happen in sports, I'd say more than anything. Um, I mentioned in my, my article a few days ago, um, growing up playing baseball all the time, the, the, the hardest thing to do is to hit a home run. And that's that's what you want to do, that's what everybody's goal is. And I remember none of my friends had hit home runs for the longest time, we'd all been looking for it. And uh, this one summer, like I was mentioned, nobody had done it before, but my buddy Chase, he stepped up to the plate and he hit this home run. And uh, me and my teammates watching him do that, that was a vicarious learning experience. And um, it led to us being able to hit home runs as well. And I believe that that would have never happened if we have never vicariously learned through watching my buddy Chase hit his first home run. So, vicarious learning. Uh, moving on, the third component of the self-efficacy process that I would like to be detailing is verbal persuasion. Um, verbal persuasion can occur through many means and through many channels, but uh, it's a huge confidence booster. And it's essentially, it's defined when You'll see verbal persuasion occur when somebody who's usually a, uh, a mentor or somebody that you look up to, in my case, it's usually a teacher or a coach of some sort. Um, it's when they tell you, hey, like, I know you might not have the confidence in yourself to do this, but I have the confidence in you. And through them telling you that, it's a massive confidence booster and it, uh, it'll, it'll make it to where you can be more effective as a human and definitely increase your self-efficacy through it. Um, it's an important tool used by managers a lot. Um, a lot of times, especially with new recruits and new hires, they don't know what they're doing in the office. They might be a little nervous or timid, but um, having a manager that look, can look you in the eyes and say, I believe in you and I believe in your ability to learn this and to accomplish this task, that's a beautiful form of verbal persuasion and it's a great way to increase uh, new employee self-efficacy. Um, in terms of a personal perspective, uh, I've been fortunate enough to have very loving parents who, when I didn't feel like I could accomplish a task, and I didn't think that I could strive to reach this goal, um, they would tell me, Ryan, you can do this. We believe in you and we trust in your abilities to do this. 
and it was always a massive confidence booster and definitely increased my self-efficacy. Um, um, so moving on, the fourth and final um, component of the self-efficacy process that I would like to be discussing is psychological and emotional arousal. Um, psychological and emotional arousal, I know the other three are all more um, kind of mental things that you can do, or you're, they're actually physical things that you can do to increase your self-efficacy. The reason I think psychological and emotional arousal is so interesting and intriguing is because it's a personal mental thing. Um, the psychological and emotional arousal theory of self-efficacy, uh, in, uh, increasing self-efficacy um, stems from feelings and mindset. Uh, it's You'll see it defined as, I know for me personally, if I go into uh, if I go into a class or a project and I have, um, you know, been struggling in something outside of that task or project, it will in turn make that task or project more difficult to do. Um, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, psychological and emotional arousal, arousal, while it can be a confidence booster and it can increase your self-efficacy, one thing that I think is interesting about it is it can also decrease your confidence and decrease your self-efficacy. Um, I know uh, the biggest, one of the bigger players in the psychological and emotional arousal aspect of the self-efficacy process is depression. Um, I'm, thank I'm thankful and fortunate enough that I do not struggle with depression, but I have friends and family members that have struggled with depression and I've seen how it manifests itself. And it, it it's a confidence, it's a confidence killer. It's very hard to accomplish a task and whether it be school or work, when you feel like you can't hardly accomplish your own personal feelings and your own personal needs to get them to where they need to be. Um, uh, the other thing about psychological and emotional arousal is, it is uh, it's backed by science. This one is the most scientifically backed uh, form of increasing your self-efficacy. Um, one thing that I like to do to, uh, to personally display this is before I go into a big test or before I have a big meeting or presentation, I like to sit down for a couple minutes and kind of gather my thoughts and uh, I guess psych myself up is the best term to put it. And I feel like if I do this and I take the time to put myself in a good mindset before accomplishing a task or trying to achieve a goal, I have found that it has consistently worked through increasing my self-efficacy and as well as my self-confidence. And um, so that is my presentation about self-efficacy. Um, thank you for tuning in and listening. I hope that this has been as informative as it is um, exciting. And um, thank you very much.